District of Conservation is sponsored by the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, better known as CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to CFACT.org. Thanks for listening to the program. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. Today's roundup is going to be short and sweet. We're going to talk about some new numbers from responsive management showing a slight decline in hunting participation numbers. And then I'm going to go a little bit into nuclear energy and why it needs to be catalyzed more and how if nuclear really is put on the forefront, red tape is removed, we really will see a diminishment and reliance on solar and wind, which are the lowest capacity factor energy sources out there. I don't know why any person is saying that you have to have nuclear side by side with solar and wind when solar and wind have the lowest reliability capabilities. They're not 24-7 baseload power, and they have perhaps even more ruinous environmental footprints than even most conventional energy sources and nuclear out there. So we're going to dive deep into these two topics. A perennial concern among those of us who work in the outdoor industry, whether you're media, outreach, wildlife agency side, public private sector, what have you, are the trends and reports showing precipitous, not exactly precipitous, but slight decline in hunter participation numbers. And this is from Responsive Management in conjunction with the Council to Advance Hunting and Shooting Sports. And I'd seen a few of my social media friends post this. I want to read for you some of the key findings from their report. This was published not too long ago, uh, June 17th, so within the last week or so, in conjunction with Responsive Management. Here are some of the key top-line findings. So overall approval rates of hunting. Rates of approval of legal hunting and recreational shooting are quite similar. 76% of Americans approve of each, while disapproval stands at 12% regarding hunting and 13% excuse me, regarding recreational shooting. Trends. The trends analysis found slightly less approval of hunting and recreational shooting in 2024 compared to 2023, but that difference was not statistically significant at the 95% confidence level. However, when compared to the high of 81% in 2021, the decline was statistically significant below 0.05. Regional variation. Approval of legal hunting is markedly higher among rural residents, male and Midwestern region residents than among U.S. residents overall. Approval of legal recreational shooting is highest among rural residents, males, residents of small cities or towns, and residents of the Mountain West region. Motivations for hunting. Hunting for food receives the highest approval with 84% of respondents approving of hunting for meat and 83% for locally obtaining food, local <laughs> obtaining, excuse me, locally sourced food. Conservation related motivations also receive strong support while trophy hunting, so called trophy hunting, let's be honest there, is the least approved motivation with only 29% approval. I don't know many people who just go hunting just to kill animals for sport. Most everyone I know does it because they like having a very impressive harvest, but mostly for the meat. I don't know if it's solely sport. For some people out there listening or the majority, I don't think it is for the majority, but because of the media portrayals of hunting, conflating it with just shooting for sport, I think that's why this result is presented. Motivations for recreational shooting. Learning to shoot for self-defense skills receives the highest approval at 77% with for competition such as Olympics close coming in close at 74%. Interestingly, for the challenge had the lowest approval of the motivations at 64% despite that being a component of competition and safety perceptions. While a large majority of Americans, 70% say that most sport shooters know how to safely handle firearms and are careful, a substantial percentage, 16% say they do not know how to properly handle firearms. When added to the percentage who responded with don't know on the question, 14%, 30% do not unequivocally say that most sport shooters know how to safely handle firearms and are careful and if you want to read more from the report, Americans' Attitudes Towards Hunting and Sport Shooting 2024, you can do so at the Council to Advance Hunting and Shooting Sports, included in the show notes. So briefly, kind of my summary into this, uh, certainly the extreme incidences of people behaving like buffoons, handling firearms, or poaching animals does not help us. I've long stated that those events and incidents can turn the public 
there's an 80% in the middle who are not strongly for hunting or strongly against hunting when you have 10% who are for hunting strongly and 10% who are strongly against hunting. There's a big 80% in the middle. This is often discussed in the industry of people who are open to hunting, not wholly opposed to it. And these incidences where there's poaching or improper use of firearms can really put a damper. Has it fully done damage? I don't know. We have seen this 5% decline across, what, three years is what I mentioned. That is a little alarming. It's not so concerning, but it is a little alarming when we're thinking of the grand scheme of things and how people, especially animal rights activists, radical environmentalists, but I repeat myself, are pushing these efforts to incrementally ban hunting. So they're going after the low-hanging fruit, the so-called unpopular or really unsavory types of hunting, like mountain lion management, grizzly bear management, black bear management, etc. So they start there because they say or presume that most Americans oppose that, even though when presented with the truth about management, would you rather have a highly regulated hunt where you take very few individuals from a population Or would you rather the government spend thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to cull species, particular animals, and then you see their numbers, their casualty numbers go up? With the case of mountain lion, let's say in California, or grizzly bears that have been culled unnecessarily because there's an absence of a hunt, even though the greater Yellowstone ecosystem grizzly bear segment has proven to have recovered. But now this administration is conditioning recovery on recovering all subspecies of lower 48 grizzly bears, which was never done before, but they're tampering with science, not following the science, and they're doing this, even though this segment in GYE has fully and scientifically recovered, exceeded their population, their carrying capacity. It's over 1,000 individuals, and that is why we're seeing more increased human-bear conflicts, for instance. So would you rather have highly regulated hunting that only removes a couple individuals from a population, or would you rather have government agents culling a lot of individual representatives, or would you rather have these wildlife animals, mountain lions, et cetera, ingesting poison, dying more, more frequently even than they would if there would have been a highly regulated hunt. If you present this scenario to those in in the 80%, in the middle, so to speak, I think a lot of them would understand the fact that it's rooted in science. It's not done out of malicious intent, but it's done because this is what the science, wildlife science dictates. That is one thing. So perception, social media doesn't help us. Could it be infighting also amongst hunters or people who don't understand these incremental threats to hunting that is also kind of undermining us or why we see a slight decline in approval for hunting and shooting sports? That perhaps could explain it. But I think it's largely attributed to media misinformation about these two activities. And again, these animal rights activists who have succeeded in incrementally trying to force on the conversation about conservation that anti-hunting is conservation and those of us who hunt are a detriment to conservation. You see these different studies and these different claims and these different reports that hunters are responsible for biodiversity loss in the United States when the opposite is true. So you also have people who are perceived to be serious thought leaders in science or in these reputable institutions who are pushing studies. Anyone can compile a study and publish it. You just need a lot of backing privately or publicly if you're working through the government. You can hypothetically create a study arguing that hunting is conservation too, but we've seen a lot of these studies, questionably scientifically or peer-reviewed studies, that have made these conclusions, wide-sweeping conclusions, that hunters are responsible for the plight of biodiversity loss when the opposite is true. We've been responsible In summary, overall, hunters and anglers have been responsible for bringing back a lot of species from the brink of extinction. So you have these institutions who are pushing up misinformation. You don't have narratives, accurate narratives being presented. Then you have these boneheaded poachers who are hunting certain species, fish or wildlife, otherwise out of season. They're publicly doing so. And then you have these animal rights activists pile on and say, and paint blanket statements that all hunters and anglers are despoiling wildlife. They're despoiling the environment. That's why we have to institute these bans. That's why Colorado's fight to prevent the statutory language to ban mountain lion management is extremely important because you will see gestures to go after other forms of hunting. We had chair Bruce Westerman from the natural resources committee on the house of representatives side come to talk on recently about the incremental bans to hunting. They're tackling and pursuing lead tackle bans. Again, low-hanging fruit doesn't sound so bad. Sounds great. You know, everyone thinks that lead is 
potentially harmful. But what they often do is they conflate lead fragments with pure lead. And nobody is ingesting lead fragments willingly or deliberately or at all. Hunters and anglers know to remove lead fragments and properly dispose of them. So you have that tactic there as well. So while these results from this study might be alarming and trigger alarm bells to those of you listening or those of you who work in the outdoor industry, our efforts are not totally for nothing. But I think we have to be mindful of the fact that perceptions of hunting and shooting sports can change overnight because of bad actors, because of misinformation, because people are twisting the science and saying that anti-science emotional arguments are scientific, inserting kind of this ESG non-scientific framework into wildlife management decisions. We see this increasingly under this federal government. I'm not going to pull any punches like you if you would see what I've seen in my research into all these different policies, the straying away from wildlife management, straying away from true conservation, removing traditional stakeholders like hunters and anglers from the table and leaning in on alarmists and people who want to undermine hunting and fishing. This has heightened me to my disillusionment of what is happening in the federal government, this twisting and contorting of conservation to mean preservation and rewilding, which the latter two are not conservation. They're totally different principles So I think you just have to be vigilant. Take these numbers, not so much with a grain of salt. See that, okay, there is a 5% decrease in support for shooting sports and hunting a little bit. What can we do to fix our numbers? How do you overcome the obstacles that are being thrown our way in media, in reputable institutions? How do you fight back? We have a lot of people now waking up or being increasingly aware of these attacks to hunting and fishing. That's why you see Florida pushing a right to hunt fish amendment to preemptively protect themselves from any radical rewrites. You have people in Colorado fighting statutory language to first outlaw mountain lion management, which could then extend to other forms of hunting, too, if they're successful with the ballot initiative. Texas, we see some challenges there, too, with mountain lions and preservation is creeping into a Republican wildlife agency. This is scary. This is what Cable Smith has told me repeatedly. We also have to watch Texas and red states, too, who are presumably pro-hunting. They're being infiltrated as well. What do you think of this study's results? Are we in danger territory? Are we to be okay? Should we retool our efforts? I would love to hear your feedback. Now, on to nuclear energy. This topic is so interesting, and there's still a lot of unknowns, I think, for me, because this is so technical, and it's very rooted in engineering. So sometimes it's a little hard to understand nuclear for those who are outside of the energy space. Even though I'm fully immersed in energy policy, nuclear still kind of confounds me, not because I'm opposed to it or I find it to be complicated, but because it's so technical, I think this is what could make people turned off to it or not understanding of why nuclear has this potential to be such a great source and really fill the void of intermittency, 24-7 baseload power. There's been a lot of news. Last week, for instance, the Advance Act passed Congress. It passed the Senate. There was a previous bill, the Atomic Act, I believe, in the House side. So they probably did conciliatory action. They came together to kind of create a framework that was amenable to both houses. That's what they do before any bill heads to the president's desk. Now the Senate version after reconciliation is heading to President Biden's desk. I think this is a rare bipartisan win from Congress because Congress is divided. Some recreation bills are starting to make some movement, have some movement, good ones that won't restrict your rights or be a burden to the taxpayers. But Efforts like the Inflation Reduction Act, which were largely passed on partisan lines. I don't recall if many Republicans supported it, but the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the Green New Deal light, it's not an inflation reducing bill, it's actually exacerbated inflation, has supercharged solar wind. I think they claim that nuclear is going to be catalyzed by it, but most of their focus is on solar and wind. And that's why solar and wind are not doing so hot, because this infusion of government money is making them not positively received in the market. And Americans, as they see their heating bills go up, they see their gasoline prices go up, home appliance costs go up, they're becoming increasingly skeptical of net zero and this insistence that we have to move away from fossil fuels to nice sounding, clean energy sources like solar and wind, when in fact you should be looking at something like nuclear if we're talking a supplement in the near term, maybe a replacement in the long term, but coal, oil, and gas still have staying power globally. I don't know if you guys know this, for those of you listening to the program, Coal is actually the most largely consumed energy source globally, even though so many people have maligned it. 
I think it's 32% globally uh, produced, consumed, and it's about uh, maybe 10% here in the United States overall. Um, so it still has some staying power too. But but nuclear, if you're really serious about clean energy, net zero carbon emissions, whatever. I don't agree with the premise of net zero. I think it's a really silly energy goal. You'll never obtain it. And then you're going to be destroying the economy in the process to reduce global temperatures. If you're lucky, if you can even see a change in global temperatures, according to the Paris Climate Accords, by 0.2 degrees Celsius, if you're lucky, nobody, when they know the truth about this, about net zero, will support this. And it's going to cost trillions of dollars globally, $215 trillion to do this. I think it's wise to take out nuclear from associating it with net zero. I think that is going to really put a damper on nuclear and actually doom it from being fully catalyzed. Look what net zero has done to solar and wind. Solar's on the verge of collapse. I don't know if you follow the trends or have seen or observed some of this. Because of China flooding the markets, because of the president infusing, again, so much federal spending in solar, propping it up artificially, not letting the markets dictate consumer interest in solar panels, rooftop solar, et cetera. California is experiencing a lot of problems with rooftop solar. If, if they're even admitting and conceding it's not working, something is amiss there. Wind energy has suffered a huge, huge collapse in the markets. Offshore wind almost collapsed last year because of just the opposition brewing in coastal communities to the construction of these gargantuan structures. Onshore wind is facing a lot of opposition. Again, both of these are very intermittent sources, which is why I think if you're wanting to push clean energy, so to speak, nuclear is the best. And I think untethering it from this notion of net zero is wise to like, you don't need to concede to these radical environmentalists say, let's do it to, to chart a net zero course. Again, you will never achieve net zero. And if you try to put yourself on the course of it, you're only going to reduce global temperatures by 0.2 degrees Celsius. A very meager change. Collapse the economy, essentially, no environmental benefit. And then ironically, if you're fully catalyzing solar and wind, which are not reliable, you're exhausting and expending more in energy backed up by fossil fuels, ironically speaking. And with the so many unknowns environmentally about solar and wind, nuclear has to be infused and injected into this conversation, which is why I wrote about it for townhall.com this week. And I'm going to do a little summarizing or scanning of the article for you. So the Advance Act is going to, I alluded to this a little bit ago, it's going to expedite the permitting process for nuclear reactors and facilitate nuclear fusion technology. It's a very technical bill, so it's not going to exactly supercharge nuclear energy, as one of my fellows informed me, but it's going to perhaps put the U.S. on a path to more nuclear exploration down the road. So there's going to need to be even a more concerted effort and follow-up attempts to deregulate nuclear, to make it more streamlined. And as I've noted at IWF and other places now, permitting reform is encumbered by and being interfered with, with all this ESG posturing, climate change posturing. So you're never going to have projects come online unless you have this consultation of all these different special interest groups, which is intentional to detract from projects coming online. This is the intent. And nuclear energy has long been associated with explosions, disasters, things of that sort. And it may be funny coming from someone like me whose family came from, I don't know, a couple hundred miles from Chernobyl. My family's from Lithuania. My dad's from Vilnius. Vilnius is a couple hundred kilometers, I believe, from Chernobyl, where that horrible disaster happened. My parents were already in the United States when this started to occur. They were already here for four months. They came in January of 86. Chernobyl happened in April of 1986. And I'm able to recognize, if someone like me can recognize that nuclear is not the enemy, it's who's in control of nuclear. That's the enemy. The Soviets were ridiculous. And they were underpinned by central planning and collectivization. So of course the government, when it's reckless and doesn't understand things and is you know centrally planned, of course there's going to be disasters like this, nuclear disasters. It's to be expected. Which is why I think the United States, which was actually one of the first to pioneer nuclear energy development, why we've ceded our power and our influence here to adversaries like China and Russia who are developing nuclear stations and nuclear power plants at a higher rate than we are. We have closed down, give or take, 41 nuclear power plants across the last few decades. We only have 94 reactors that are fully operational. We just saw, thankfully, units three and four of Georgia power plant Vogel 
come online. It's going to power, I think, in totality, a million homes for the next 60 to 80 years. There are some concerns about costs and if that's going to be passed down to the ratepayers and if we'll see that difference wiped out, if it will be cheaper in the long run. I hope so. But that project took forever to come online. And you even see this administration say we need 98 more reactors to chart a net zero course. Again, I think you have to divorce nuclear from net zero. Because net zero is going to doom nuclear, as we've seen it doom solar and wind. A new report that came out suggests that China is 15 years ahead of us. China, which is the world's worst polluter, they're pushing and flooding European markets and American markets with EVs. They own and control the largest share of processing of rare earth elements and refining rare earth elements. And they're having an advantage over us on nuclear energy. That says a lot of what... Our priorities are the fact that we see this administration chart a net zero course over actually being serious about energy policy. Now they're like, oh my gosh, we lament this. Oh no, now we have to put, we need 98 more reactors. Yeah, duh, you shouldn't have been focused on the superfluous stuff that has nothing to do with energy security, but this is what this administration focuses on. And then we hear these reports that China has a competitive advantage over us. The report from the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation says that China's rapid deployment of ever more modern nuclear power plants over time produces significant scale economies and learning by doing effects. And this suggests that Chinese enterprises will gain an advantage at incremental innovation in the sector going forward. That is a concern. This is from recently, a few days ago within the last week. Why is nuclear worthwhile to pursue? Why do we need the government to get out of the way and let innovation happen here? Because it's the cleanest energy source out there. It's a 24-7 baseload power. And it only comprises 18.6% of our electricity generation. However, there's untapped potential to expand this undervalued nuclear source. The Department of Energy even says that nuclear is the best and most reliable energy source out there with a 93% capacity factor, meaning it's reliable for 93% of the year across 365 days. Wind and solar boast the lowest capacity factors of energy, energy sources out there with it being 35.4% and 24.9% respectively. Nuclear is actually, as an industry, very stable. Thousands of jobs are guaranteed or required when you're building up these facilities. And then permanent jobs, I think, can total up to 800 individual jobs for this reactor or for the facility spanning engineering and non-engineering careers. The NEI also reports that nuclear workers' salaries are 50% higher on average than those of other electricity-generating sources. Even the Council on Foreign Relations says that nuclear is the most environmentally friendly source, saying that researchers have found that nuclear power is by far the most land-efficient for electricity generation compared to other energy sources. To generate the same amount of electricity, it needs 27 times less land than coal, 18 times less than hydropower plants and 34 times less than solar. And I argue in the article, why bulldoze millions of public and private land acres for unreliable solar and wind when you can have nuclear power plants that use a fraction of land. I think it's one square mile for nuclear power plants. So we have to see a federal government. I hope the Let's say if we get a hypothetical Trump administration back into the White House, we see this catalyzation of nuclear I would love to hear the president, former president, talk about this at Tuesday's forthcoming debate. We will see. He has railed against, rightfully so, net zero, but I would love for him to expand on what he would be for. And I think being for nuclear, geothermal, hydropower, and continued use of oil, coal, and gas is smart. But if he really says and dedicates you know, his platform to catalyzing nuclear even more than the Biden administration, he's going to win a lot of people over. I'm certain of that. So catalyzing nuclear can be done, but you have bureaucratic red tape. You have this preference by the government to advantage solar and wind companies. These are going to create so many little mini cylindras. It's going to be cylindra on steroids. Once we see the after effects, or let's say the Biden administration ends at the beginning of January 2025, we're going to see a lot of stuff uncovered from IRA misusing of funds to all these different companies going bankrupt like they previously did under Solyndra and other examples when the Obama administration was putting in all this federal money, injecting all this federal money behind companies that couldn't sustain themselves in the private market and needed government to come in and barely prop them up. I think we're going to see even more of that happen. 
So I think, again, divorce nuclear from net zero, deregulate and reform the permitting process so we can get more facilities constructed so we're not behind China and Russia. And I think the nuclear industry has to kind of demystify who they are more and they can do it with the help of media folks like me. I love going into different energy facilities and learning the trades and learning the tricks behind what is done. Nuclear, it's going to be a little harder to tap into because of just how highly sensitive and secure those facilities are. But I've been in talks with people who are associated with Vogel plant in Georgia to potentially maybe go there in the near future. I would hope that I can have such an opportunity for Conservation Nation or IWF CEC. We'll see what happens there. But I think just demystifying the industry more and having media come and learn about it and about baseload power and about what they do and their footprint and how they don't exhaust a lot in energy and how their environmental pr- footprint is so minuscule compared to other energy sources out there. So I'm fully on board nuclear. If a daughter of Soviet escapees like me can be for nuclear, I know you can too. So don't listen to the misinformation by radical environmentalists and those who are supporting intermittent, highly questionable so-called clean energy sources because they are probably benefiting from such touting and endorsement of it, even though it's going to have more trade-offs, negative trade-offs in the process. So I'm all for nuclear Let's see if we can get it fully catalyzed more, whether it's now or hopefully under a future second presidential term, if we are to witness that this. If you enjoyed this installment of District of Conservation, I would love to know your feedback. Send it my way. Please be sure to leave us reviews on Apple, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are played. And also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to never miss a beat nor a guest announcement. Thanks so much for listening to District of Conservation. I hope you have a wonderful day. And please share the podcast to those who may be interested in learning more about these critical natural resources, environment, energy issues.